Studio B at KPRC Channel 2. Houston Life starts now. Well, happy Thursday, everybody, and welcome to Houston Life on this August 27th. Thursday, also known as Friday, Friday Eve, Eve, Courtney. Eve. Oh. Let me tell you, we need a Friday Eve. We need a Friday. And we can all like take a sigh of relief, take a breath, right? Uh, obviously, a lot of people are hurting out there in Louisiana, um, and our hearts go out to them. And so many transplants from Louisiana Absolutely. in the Houston area. So I know a lot of us last night were just glued to that coverage. Absolutely. And clearly, uh, you know, it wasn't our storm, but our hearts and prayers are being sent uh, to those on the east side, uh, our neighbors to the east, uh, who are dealing now with the cleanup. And uh, the good news is, I know that the restoration of electricity and things like that worked very quickly. Um, and I do know, didn't we have, we had photos of the, the convoy headed uh, Head out. out there now. Yeah, yeah. and it, that was always incredible to see that. So many people jumping in to help out. And I do think if we have the web computer, we can show you guys. Um, they're working on getting you some video to show you uh, this convoy that's headed out. A lot of them to Beaumont and Port Arthur areas, right. but to Louisiana as well, just to help out um, because a lot of people, Again, we dodged a bullet last night, but a lot of people are definitely cleaning up the mess today. Absolutely. Um, also, you know what? We can't ignore what's happening here because this I is know. like a party on our set right now. It smells now. like sugar. It does. And it's perfect for Sugar Rush. You guys have seen this, right, on Netflix. I know that you haven't finished watching all of Netflix, right? But specifically, season three, episode six, highlights some Houston faves in our neck of the woods. Yeah, and the cake that we just took a close-up of, this is from Susie B's. Katie and Tom Johnston up in Cyprus have this bakery, Susie B's Bakery. And this is an almond cake with strawberry buttercream filling. And they also delivered this uh, assortment of goodies that's right in front of me, Courtney, oh, over here. The French macarons, the cookies. It is absolutely beautiful. And when I say it smells like sugar. It does. It really smells like sugar. I know. It, this Netflix show is really great. It's a competition that challenges bakers to create treats that look a beautiful and also taste amazing all against the clock, right? That's the big thing. We're going to meet three local contestants that made awesome confections on the show. That's coming up a little bit later. Really showed off their skills. And as Derek mentioned, we've been looking at Susie B's kind of bragging on them in the Cyprus area. Ka uh, Katie and Tim Johnston, husband and wife duo. I am so amazed at the work that goes into this because oh, not yeah. only, you know, baking is all about the art form, right? And how it looks. And Katie, our floor director, pointed out about your tray in front of you, Derek, that she loves how they made the dessert look like dessert. You know, like there's a cookie donut, <laughs> you know? Oh, that's funny. It's really cool, right? Um, and then what's in front of me, so awesome. This is from Ileana, and she's with Sophista Cake. Look at this. It's a it's a cake pop. A little text pop. That looks like Texo. Oh, my gosh. That's adorable. I know. But also, see, she knows us well. Got mm. a margarita cookie. <laughs> yes, girl. Yes. Get the party started. I can't wait. And I did say that Oscar, you know, our, our puppy is going to be one in November. And AJ was very concerned because he said, we have to have a puppy party, right? I said, absolutely, we're going to have a puppy party. I mean, it's what makes sense. For sure. You could get some puppy pops. So now we need some puppy pops that look like golden doodles. And I think she can probably make that happen. The cake and the cookies all taken care of. Very <laughs> cute. This is delicious, by the way. And Ileana's out of Sugarland, I should mention, with yeah. Sophista Cake. And I thought, well, isn't that perfect? Just down the road from Channel 2. Yeah, making sugar in Sugarland. I like some it. Puppy pops there every day. Is it weird that I'm going to eat Tex? Oh, I didn't even think about that. Mildly uncomfortable, but I bet it's delicious. Maybe I'll just I eat bet his it's ear. worth it. Just an ear. It's always so great when we can showcase local Houstonians, totally. local talent. And uh, again, Sugar Rush on Netflix. Mm. And uh, we'll follow up a little later on. Also coming up today, Houston SPCA's Wildlife Center of Texas. A lot of animals right now, they're assuming, sort of expecting, that some animals like that owl you're seeing on your screen were affected by the storm, even though we really dodged Hurricane Laura. And there is Lauren Kelly live out at the Houston SPCA. She's going to have tips on how we can help injured wild animals. And that's not stuffed. That's real. And I believe it's a screech owl, it looks right? Like an I mean, screech that, owl. it's crazy. It's we heard some in our neighborhood the other night. North Orlando went to go take out Oscar, and we heard the screech owl. So beautiful that we can see them and hear them in our neighborhood. Yeah. Um, but obviously, if it's at the SPCA. 
clearly it's been rescued, it needs some help, so all, they're always willing to help out, you know? And they're expecting all kinds of animals to be brought in, so if you find injured animals, we're going to cover this a little later on in today's show, what you should do, who you should call, owls, possums, you name it. They're going to get them, for sure. Okay, so we mentioned the convoy. Y'all, we've got this now. Check this out. This is, you know, what happens. We know what happens and how bad storms can be. Um, this is really incredible when you see everybody kind of banding together and going out into those areas to help out, and that's exactly what we're seeing with this convoy right now. Yeah, and you want to stay tuned for the latest updates on the aftermath of the storm, ways we can help our neighbors out in Louisiana. That's coming up on Channel 2 News at 4 p.m., so stay with us for uh, the hour and beyond. I know. So, what? No, I'm just seeing all of these videos, and even last night, I know that, that we didn't take a direct hit here in Houston. Thankfully, yeah. But I feel like it's, for a lot of people, it triggers bad memories, PTSD perhaps. Uh, we, we mentioned on yesterday's show, every single hurricane is totally different. Whether mm -hmm. you're on the east side of the storm, the dirty side, or the west side of the storm, the clean, clean side. side. Yeah. I mean, it's and the, the between the wind and the rain and the flooding and any combination of those things um, can be horribly devastating. And I think that just because you've lived through one or two hurricanes doesn't mean a third can't come along and be a totally new experience. And even preparing for a big storm like this is stressful. The fear of the unknown, right? Absolutely, and I think too, you know, um, there was, there's always that fear, right? When you, within hurricane season, I, and it's a long season, right? Ju yeah. June to November. And um, regardless of how long you've lived in it or been through one or two, I really think it's time to exhale because in the forecasting of all of this, we don't know until we know. Yeah. It can shift, it can shift away, it can shift towards. So once we're breathing a sigh of relief, you know, someone else is really hunkering down. And I think that's one thing that you have to remember just because we're out of it doesn't, uh, doesn't mean, mean someone else is. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's what's so devastating is that, you know, before the storm yesterday, it, it was sunny and it was hard to believe that we were kind of preparing for something like this. This morning, we wake up, not a drop of rain, and life is sort of back to normal for all of us, right? But yet, not too far away from us is complete devastation. Yeah. And so it's hard to sort of continue with your day without thinking about the people who are really hurting. Of course, just because we're relieved doesn't mean, right. you know, other people aren't in a total mess right now. I remember being younger. <laughs> I remember being younger too. <laughs> barely. I barely remember being younger. But I mentioned that Hur Hurricane Floyd, when it hit in 1999, I was dispatched to go out to North Carolina. And I was really focused on the aftermath of that storm. And that was the first time I had ever come face to face with flooding and just how devastating a flood can yes. be. And I remember going into homes, homes that had been built up to a second story, where the first story was a, a carport. Right. Much like the coastal towns and cities we have here in this area are built. And I remember seeing a refrigerator that had once been in someone's garage that was like wedged up into the top of the, you know, up into the rafters and the mold and the debris and yes, the snakes in people's swimming pools and the dirt. It was just, it was so unbelievably devastating. I thought, wow, how, how does anyone even begin to clean up after something like this. And then, of course, when, when Harvey hit us three years ago, hard to believe we just marked that anniversary. I mean, so many people, it's not just the days of the aftermath, it's it's months and months. Do you remember all the debris all in and around the Houston yes, area? Yes, it wasn't Harvey? picked up, and, you know, it just seemed like those piles were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, much like you, you know, I didn't grow up with hur hurricanes, and uh, being from Chicago, we dealt with tornadoes, flash mm -hmm. flooding, that kind of thing, where you have no preparation time. Um, and I covered several storms here, and it really wasn't until I got to Houston that I was sort of in the hurricane world and, and tropical storms, obviously, and, and just mass flooding. Um, so a number of storms that, that I covered, but the eeriness, I'll never forget it, is driving uh, into Galveston during Rita when it was gridlock for, you know, everybody leaving. And literally, Steve Long and I, my photographer, uh, we were the only cars other than army vehicles on the road going into Galveston. And I, I didn't realize sort of what this all meant until we got into City Hall. And at the time, uh, Mayor Lida Ann walked in and I, her face was just stark white. There was no blood in her face. And she said, we are bracing for the absolute worst. This could be a Category 5 hurricane. And I looked at my photographer and I thought, can we leave now? I 
I mean, you know, I mean, it just was bizarre that we are there because we had to be there. And a strange feeling when you're going in and everyone else is coming out. It was so, so bizarre. And it was literally like a war zone, right? Because there were only, it was high water vehicles, it was army vehicles that were making their way in there to prepare. We stayed at the San Luis, which, you know, is, is a bunker, built on a bunker, the safest place to be um, in Galveston. And it's just a bizarre feeling. I mean, I, you know, and thankfully, again, Rita turned, and it, was, it wasn't it was as bad as they thought it was going to be. But my gosh, it's just, it's so devastating for those who are going through it. And just the loss of everything that you think of, that right. you have in your home. And uh, They always say that people can't be replaced. It's the property. Yes. But, but with the property and the personal belongings that are lost in a hurricane, people attach memories to things, of course, right? Right. So if you have a home that is devastated, yeah, it's just a thing. But if you raised your family there or your grandparents yeah. live there, of yeah, course, it like, loss is loss. Yeah, we have we have deep ties to our our things. In 2004, uh, you know that for a long time I was a political reporter, and so I would travel with candidates and I would cover the Democratic National Convention, the Republican Convention, and I was covering the convention that was happening at Madison Square Garden summer of 2004 and I after spending a couple days there Hurricane Francis was on its way to Florida so they sent me down to Florida and I didn't have anything to wear except suits perfect for a hurricane perfect for a hurricane <laughs> put on a nice tie and a suit get on out I yeah. did have one pair of white shorts they were cargo shorts perfect <laughs> yes. perfect for the time very very <laughs> fashionable did you stop at like Walmart or something to stock up get some well water Walmart we we did go to Walmart it's funny you should ask how did you know this it's like that's your just psychic. where it's it's where you go for storm preparations well when we got the there there were giant bales of soil in front of the Walmart. It was shut down. It was completely closed. So the only thing that was in, in operation, in service, was a local gas station. And you got an Iron Maiden t-shirt. We, we were. <laughs> we, I had like gym clothes from my suitcase. And I remember buying pork and beans yes. in a can. Lovely. And peanut butter. Mm -hmm. And I think some little jello cups, and that's what we lived on for like three days. Oh, yeah. And my, my producer and I lived on this stuff. And then when the power went out, see, before I had covered a hurricane, I always thought, oh, these reporters are out there blowing in the wind. Ooh, it's like a chilly winter day. It was hot. Sticky. It was so hot yeah. and sticky. And then to go back to a hotel room, we didn't have power. It was just a mess. And the only light that I had was this dumb little keychain flashlight that I had gotten in a gift bag from the convention in New York. <laughs> so I was trying to write in my journal. The phones were down. I was like yes. writing in my journal with this little flashlight. Then the flashlight burned out. I have that journal somewhere. I should have brought you, it in today. Yeah, you need to dig that up for sure. It was just a very interesting experience to, you know, at night, wondering whether the, the windows would blow in and I would be impaled by glass. Yes. Uh, but it all worked out. I took the mattress, leaned it up against the wall, and made it through. Crazy times, I'm telling you. I did buy some um, some clothes, not during a hurricane. It was right after um, Columbia, the space shuttle um, Columbia oh, explosion. I, I was sent to East Texas, and I didn't have enough clothes. And so a photographer and I stopped at, at the one Walmart on the way, and um, I loaded up there. We were... Uh, that was actually my first week on the job here at the station. Wow. And I was there, I think, 17 days or 12 days or something like that. So what off my Walmart uh, wardrobe. I That's covered what you do. the Columbia disaster as well. Yeah. I was see? in Florida that morning and they sent me to Houston. I'm telling you, Center. we just, we passed, passed Trains passed. passing in the night. Yeah, well, exactly. Don't you find, though, we mentioned this a moment ago, that you feel a level of stress, the, the unknown, like sure. how bad will it be? And the other day, I was feeling kind of helpless, as many of us were like, well, what do we do? We're, I mean, we're not in an evacuation zone. Our zip code was just on the edge of mm -hmm. a suggested evacuation zone. Uh, one of our producers, Kat, she was joking about she was so nervous, she just spent the day cleaning her house just to feel like she was doing something. Right. So I stopped by. I knew that we would be home probably cooking for a few. I was imagining, okay, we're going to be stuck at home. It's stocked up. We're going to be cooking at home. So I thought of you. Something happened, and I thought of you. Because okay. I thought, because I... <laughs> Uh-oh. 
I, I don't know what this means. I knew you would appreciate that. So I okay. stopped by Williams Sonoma, which I love. I mean, to go and just just to go to that store and so pretty. It's so yeah. pretty. Just brand to look, new appliances. Look at stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, one day I want to do an all copper kitchen. No, and then you you just look at the stuff and whatever. So I figured I would buy a few kitchen items. Well, the moment I I got inside the store, and I love the people. They're just so nice and wonderful there in Highland Village. So I should. The disclaimer before I tell this story is that you know how much I love kids, right? Yes. I love children. I, I have no idea where this is going. I love okay. children and, you know, my nieces, they've been on the show. Like, we, like we're good with kids, right? Yeah, kids. my boys love you. A big Absolutely. Fan. Usually if I have a problem with a child, it's because, like, their parents kind of... <laughs> terrible. Are annoying. No, I'm just kidding. Terrible. Right. Kids parents? are raised by... Terrible. Whatever. Okay. So... I go inside the store and I notice these two kids and they're kind of small, like three and five years old, like running around. I was like, oh wow, these kids are just like alone in the store. There's no parent. And they were over in the mug se section off to the left side. You know how the, the mugs? Yes, like the, like the tower. The, the tower yeah. of mugs. Yeah. So in the younger one's hand, there is this little glass mug. That's, you know those pretty double walled mugs? Yes. That they're insulated, they're so beautiful and yes. sort of fragile looking. They keep your coffee warm. So yeah. these kids are like running around the store, like waving this mug around. And I thought, well, first of all, you know I'm not psychic. I mean, can we just, for the record, I am not psychic. No. But somehow I knew exactly what was about to happen. Yes, give me the play by play. What do you think happened? The, it, the, gla the mugs broke. Yes. They dropped like, the mugs. Suddenly, I hear a crash, and this, yes, and the employees, who are also great, they jumped Rushed in. Rushed over. Like, oh, you know, are, are you okay? Is everything okay? Don't Where's worry, we'll parent? get this. Well, she was there. She was there. She was busy doing other things. And she did, after the glass broke, I heard her say a lot of things, you know, to her kids, whatever, this and that. The thing that I did not hear her say was, oh, I'm so sorry about this scenario. But it, <laughs> we've talked about this on the show before, just sort of the awkward idea of disciplining other people's kids. Like, you're never going to speak up and say, hey, hey, you really should. Control your kids. <laughs> <laughs> never say that. And again, I love kids. I was telling Lewis, best friend Lewis in LA about this, and he owns a retail store in LA that has dishes and like knives and stuff. Yes, tchotchkes, yes. And he has kids come in the store all the time. He gives them M&Ms. It's like, oh, welcome to the store, whatever. But every once in a while, he'll call me and be like, there was some kid in the store. There was a rogue child. Running around with a knife. And the parent was just sort of nonchalant. So you know what Lewis does? He'll grab the knife and be like, ah. Don't Thank cut you. yourself. Thanks. <laughs> like, slam it down behind the counter. Well, and I think as a business owner, for sure, they have every right, right, to say something. I'm, what was she doing? Shopping? On the phone? Registry? What was happening? You had to look. What was she doing? I don't know. She was, I don't know, looking for stuff. She was busy shopping. On the phone? I don't know. Being you parent, know, again, you know you're not completing the Being a the parent vision. can be one of the toughest jobs, right? But what happens it when is, you're in... It is, but if you're, they're unruly, then don't go into Williams-Sonoma with them. What if they're in your house? Oh, remember that story? Did I ever tell you yes. this story? I don't think I told our viewers. This is a good one. So we had, Brandon had this coworker who, it's, for some reason, I don't remember why she was at her house. And again, I love children. I don't think you need to offer the disclaimer. I really you do, do love children. I do love kids. And it, you know, this particular child was just, we had people over at our house. <laughs> and, our, you know, our house Again, is very wasn't vertical. Being watched, we have a very right? tall house. So we have, you know, it's the, several stairs for each floor. Yeah, like we ha up on the fourth floor, we have a roof deck where. Children typically would not be unattended. Upsta like on the third floor, their bedrooms and stuff. So whatever. We're downstairs in the kitchen. And before I know it, this four-year-old child <laughs> is like running this through the house. This is a different way it was described to me to begin with. Running through. <laughs> you call that monster a human? <laughs> there were way more adjectives being thrown around. They thought she was adorable. The parents? And no one else did. I know. So, yes. <laughs> like I said, terrible people raise terrible kids. But, but, but it was a snow globe, right? 
Well, yeah, so we're all downstairs in the kitchen, and I'm starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable because I'm like, okay, there is a four-year-old child running through the house. Downstairs, third floor, is she up on the roof? Is she about to jump? I don't know. This is my house. But just because we invited you over to serve you dinner, does that mean we're, like, also babysitting your monster, your uh -uh. child? <laughs> <laughs> but tell the story. But what, what do you do in that situation do like what would you have done i knew she was upstairs running around. i could hear her running around why thought, didn't you okay, say where's susie <laughs> kim because where that, is your susie because that wasn't her name well do you know what i mean whatever her name is you would have said i i don't see her but i hear her somewhere in my house can you maybe go find your daughter the awkwardness doesn't come from the child it comes from the parents totally it comes from the parents who are totally oblivious well this child eventually appeared and she was standing on the stairs holding a snow globe and i thought oh wow this is kind of awkward again of not psychic but and the snow globe which she had gotten out of one of the guest rooms she was like running around with the this glass. Thing. And it, you're right. Again, I'm not psychic, but somehow I knew <laughs> what was going to happen. So she's running around the house with this snow globe, and I was thinking, okay, again, is it my, this is my house, but is it my job to discipline your child or maybe pull him aside and be like, honey, this is not your house. Put down the snow globe. That. Sure enough, crash. Glass everywhere, broken snow globe. And you know what I did? I sat there. I just... I, I just sat there and I thought, you know what, I'm not, I'm not jumping in and cleaning this up. Guess who cleaned it up? Brandon. Not, Brandon. Yeah. Not the parents. But, but did the parents say anything? That's what I think. Like, did they say, no. oh, my word, I am so sorry. No, and heaven forbid they even replace the item that was broken. Like, it wasn't even on their radar to be like, listen, I'm so sorry this happened. I'm so sorry, Brandon, you just cleaned up all this glass. They just sat there and continued on. Ugh. I don't know. What I'm trying to say is... Control your kid. <laughs> I don't hate children. I don't. And I know. I have kids. But, you know, one of the things that I love about the show is that we, we can sort of work through these awkward moments together. Right. And so many times, some of the best ideas and advice we've gotten, it's come from you guys. It's come from our totally. viewers. If you have any stories about, like, awkward parenting moments or, or times when you felt like you needed to step in, in your own home, in a store, let me know what happened. Well, yeah. first of all, if it's a funny story, share it with us. We'll try to share it on the show. And if you have advice for me also I'm all ears well remember that happened to me when I when uh, we had the floods and I had to hunk I was um, on my way I had a shoot downtown I was on my way back to the station and I had to um, wait out the storm um, I forget which storm this oh, was. It was yes. the, the flooding. And you were off 59. I was off 59 in Wesleyan <laughs> at Skeeter's, and there was a situation in the restaurant with a probably a four-year-old. Um, what were they doing, like, messing with it, like, in the Climbed up on, like, the thing of high chairs that were stacked in the back by the by the bathroom oh, no. so they had the wooden high chairs that were kind of stacked on so precarious. and then there were candy machines so the kid had climbed up <gasps> on the to um, try to reach the candy but was on top of the candy machine that is so dangerous and i mean i'm watching the whole thing happen and people are working because there was nowhere else to go everybody's on their computers and listening and but i the way i was positioned i was looking at said child and i thought i'm just going to ignore this courtney just ignore it because you shouldn't step in but what, then what if what you if become that crazy tv lady that's now like you know so i just said but then i thought that horrible what if he courtney falls? zavala discipline what if he my falls child. and then i don't say anything and then, then it's my bad fault, for right? the rest of your life so i what? i did i said ma'am excuse me is, is that your child there on the top of those high chairs and candy machine <laughs> oh yeah sip sip just kind of no you know they have great margaritas at skeeters <laughs> i can use one right now <laughs> now that is awkward sip, sip. and then this I is thought, the irony I mean, I then you that become the bad guy then i'm the bad guy said, and we have all seen these karen videos you know at costco freaking out when the manager yeah. tells them to wear a mask yeah sometimes i worry about retaliation and it I seems know. like if you were the person who stands for like truth and reason and sorry your kid's about to break his neck you become the bad guy i know Sorry, your kids are running around with a glass mug. I think it's maybe not the best idea. I would have been the bad guy had I said anything. I know. I should have gone up and been like, um, I'm psychic Dion Warwick. <laughs>
and I, I can know what's going to happen. I can see into your future. <laughs> you break it, you just bought it. <laughs> but what bugs me is the people at Williams Sonoma are so nice. So nice. I'm sure they didn't charge her I'm for sure. that. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. But I think they should have. Because there are accidents. It happens. There's sorry. accidents. Like, remember when Connor knocked over all the bikes and sons? <laughs> You need Don't to touch refresh. anything. Don't touch anything. We need to refresh our memory on this story. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll have a quick recap of that story right after this. Yeah. Mother of the year. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about terrible parents who raise terrible children. And speaking of that, Courtney has a story about what one of her kids did. Look at I, we were we went to the movie at um, Memorial City Mall pre-COVID. This was last summer, and we wanted to walk through. Orlando went to the car, and Connor and AJ wanted to go to Sun and Ski to kind of like see the ski the um, skateboards and the bikes and everything. And and Connor's kind of he's a toucher. He wants to like pick everything up, and you know he's gonna hate me when he when I come home today. But he kind of you know he's walks through right and now, you know he? has to look at everything with his hands. And so we walked in, and I said he's learning Braille. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch anything. Don't just, we're, we're going to go to the skateboards. AJ wanted to see some scuba, scuba mass or whatever. And we get over there and, you know, it literally was like the Pee Wee Herman movie. <laughs> Leaned on all these bikes and it was the domino effect of the entire display in the store toppled over. And How he, many bikes are we talking about? I mean, there was probably 25. <laughs> oh, that's nothing. It's no big deal. I... He is so sensitive, right? So I was like, Connor, you know, I mean, I, I, and I'm trying to pick it up, and the guy comes over to help, and I said, let us help you. Let it, he's like, ma'am, I, I got it. You've already got done it. enough <laughs> damage. I know. Move Please away leave. from the bikes. Please leave. You may exit the store now. I walked to the car, and I had mascara <laughs> running because I was laughing so hard, but I was trying not to let him know that I was laughing. We get oh. in the car, and it was, I, I laughed the entire way home, <laughs> but I did apologize and for here it. Here we are still laughing a year <laughs> later. <laughs> Like I said, terrible parents raised... I'm kidding, I know. I'm kidding. It was I an know. accident. It was. Difference between accident and complete... Negatives. Denial, exactly. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Okay, guys, we do want to tell you about a special project our buddy Tex is part of. In honor of Clear the Shelters this month, you can now purchase a 2021 Tex and Friends calendar. Yeah, a reminder that the first 100 people to donate 25 bucks or more to Texas Foundation, which is his charitable fund, will receive a limited edition calendar starring Tex and some of his rescued friends. Proceeds benefit the Houston Humane Society, and you can find all the details online of click2houston.com slash Pets. And I think there are just a few more calendars yeah. left. So We're good. Selling out. All right. We will be right back with a look at what is coming up on Channel 2 News at 4. Don't go away. Okay. Well, we are recovering <laughs> from a laugh attack. So we're... <laughs> I'm going to need gonna... a box of dishes. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to take a moment to get some fresh air and send it on over to Keith and Christine over in Studio A. We are so sorry. Oh, man. You we know? understand being yeah. the case of the giggles. Yeah. Better you than you, than, better you guys than us right now. Sometimes you just have to laugh it off, I know. yeah, for sure. Laugh yeah. it off. We'll take the moments of levity, you guys. Great to see you <laughs> and in good spirits. Um, we do have a lot coming up at 4 o'clock today. Of course, we're getting to see the true scope of the damage in Louisiana from Hurricane Laura. Yeah, Sky 2 flew over parts of Cameron Parish and into the Lake Charles area. The swath of damage is huge. We've got a team of reporters spanned out across East Texas and into Louisiana to bring you a better perspective of the destruction and what it's going to take to rebuild. And our chief meteorologist Frank Billingsley was following the path of the storm very carefully last night and was a part of Houston's only lo live continuous coverage of Hurricane Laura barreling into Louisiana. Frank, there were some intense moments overnight. Did you see Robert Arnold at the oh, Golden Nugget? Was watching, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. that was incredible. And you know, there were 120 mile an hour wind gusts in Lake Charles for a solid hour. This was one of the top ones was 134, but 120 over and over and over again. And when we look at the damage, it's certainly Certainly is wind over water, uh, which most people would take, but still, it's devastating. Cameron was 127 mile an hour winds, 95 at La Cassine Refuge. Sabine Pass was 90 to Ritter, which is north of Lake Charles, at 82. We're still gathering some water information we'll have at 4 o'clock. Right now, it's a 1 p.m. advisory right through Arkansas. Windy and rainy and gusty there, continuing with 65 mile an hour winds, and it will continue to slide right up through Arkansas, Missouri, and on in to parts of Kentucky and uh, Virginia Saturday. So it's not done yet as far as making a 
a little bit of trouble for some folks. For us, it's a hot day. My car thermometer said 99, 97 right Same. now in Houston, 104. Sugarlands 94, 90 in Galveston. Have a few changes. I have some a uh, little bit of rain in the forecast to talk about as we go toward the weekend. I'll have that at four o'clock. And there are a couple of there are a couple of systems on the board for the tropics. We need to at least address them, but we'll do that gently at four o'clock. How's that? Yeah, we're not out of the woods yet. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to complain about the sun or the heat today That's or right. the rest of the week. We'll <laughs> take it. We'll yeah. take it, Frank. We appreciate that. Thank you. All right, Derek Courtney, we'll get back to you. Do guys. you guys get it back together? Yes, take a deep breath. Did. We're all business deep now. Breath. There we, we go. We've, we've got it. Yeah. We've got it for Thanks, sure. Guys. Thanks, guys. We'll see you at four. Um, coming up after the break, Lauren Kelly is going to check in from the Houston SPCA's Wildlife Center of Texas with tips on how we can help wild animals around town that may have been affected by bad weather. That's next. of Hurricane Laura. Guys like this little guy right here, after every rainstorm, might need help. And we are going to depend on our friends at the Houston SP, uh, SPCA's Wildlife Center of Texas. I have called upon my friend, Brooke Yaney. She is part of the rehabilitation team here. And we've got so many questions about what people need to do when they find wildlife in their backyard or in their neighborhoods. Right. So where should we start if we see a squirrel or a little bird or any of these little guys that look like they need some help? Yeah, the, I mean, the first thing to do is determine whether or not they actually need help. Um, an, an adult bird that's on the ground might not necessarily be injured, um, but if, if an animal looks injured or it's a baby and you think, hey, that's too small to be on its own, um, then that's a good place to start. And, and our organization, that's what we do. We, we take those animals in, we rehabilitate them, and we try to release them back into the wild. So what we have been talking about is basically kind of the list of steps you should be taking when you find these animals. And what you should do is carefully pick them up, not feed them, kind of keep them warm, and then call you guys and figure out when to bring them in. Is that pretty much the steps that people should be doing? Right, exactly. When you find a baby, um, especially like a baby bird or a baby squirrel after a storm, most likely they're going to be wet, they're going to be cold, they're going to be uh, shivering, those kind of things. So the, the most important thing is to keep them warm. Okay. Um, everyone thinks that the first thing you should do is feed it, and that no. is absolutely not okay. the right idea. <laughs> well, yeah. let's talk about who we've got right yeah, here. Yeah, for sure. We, we have a couple of guys here to show you. This is a little baby cardinal. I'm going to see if I can get him to step up on me. Okay, he's here. so tiny, he's so cute. There we go. Um, so this is an example of a baby bird that you might find after a storm. This little cardinal, he's not quite old enough to fly yet. He's getting there, he's definitely getting there. He's about maybe a couple days to a week away. Whoop. And um, so if you find a baby bird like this after a storm, um, he might not be orphaned. A lot of people will pick something like this up and say, oh, immediately he needs help, but he might not. Um, their, their parents are usually very right, good about right. taking care of them and they, they do an excellent job, obviously. Um, so the first thing to do is determine, hey, is this bird being taken care of by his parents or is this bird truly orphaned or needs help? Right, um, just kind of assessing the situation. Yeah, for sure. Brooke, I just want to look really quickly through. <laughs> He's gonna take his time to go out. We've got the little baby ducklings. We've got a teeny tiny baby squirrel. I feel like squirrels are very common in neighborhoods as well. Yes, for sure. Um, so when you bring those in, that key is to just keep them warm because this little yes. guy looks like he's super tiny. His eyes aren't even open yet. I know, he's probably about three weeks old. Um, and again, we want to stress, if you find a bird like, or a, a squirrel like this, don't feed it. Don't try to give it any kind of milk or, or anything. Um, you just want to get it to a rehabilitator as soon as you can. Um, but again, like birds, they might not be orphaned. The moms do come down from the trees and, and grab them and pick them up and take them back. That's great. Um, but yeah. Well, Brooke, thank you so much for all the information. You guys are so wonderful. We thank you. The animals thank you for what they do. More information, just email them. Info at wildlifecenteroftexas.org. You guys can find all the information at houstonlife.tv as well. Derek and Courtney, back to you guys. Oh so my cute. Oh gosh, they're adorable. And it's great to see all the good work being done over I there. I know. We're ooing and aahing over here and I love seeing sort of the behind the scenes and that owl just staring. I love it. Lauren, thank you so much. But you do have another really cool story coming up for us too. I'm a big fan of this one. Yeah, guys, coming up, we've got a behind-the-scenes look at how some of our favorite cat's coffee is roasted a little bit later on in the show. Don't go anywhere. Very nice. Right and after the break, we're having a sweet day. We're going to chat with the local contestants featured on Netflix's Sugar Rush Extra Sweet. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. We love shining a spotlight on local talent, making it big on the national stage. And that's what three Houstonians were able to do on Netflix Sugar Rush, a competition where they showed off their baking and decorating skills. Skills, I might add, mm -hmm. major skills. Joining us now, now are Tom and Katie Johnston from Susie B's in Cyprus and Ileana Rincon, sugar artist with Sophisticate in Sugarland, to chat about their experiences on the show. Welcome to Houston Life, all of you. Thanks for being here. Hi. That's Thanks so awesome. Us. Katie and um, t Tom, let's start with you first of all. You're se you were on season three, episode three, um, and you guys were on The Perfect Illusion. What was that task like? Um, it was crazy. Not only so for the first round, we had to do a realism cake. And then the second round, we had to do a magic theme that included a magic ingredient and an action for the judges. And then in the third round, we had to do a levitating cake. Oh, oh my gosh. And yeah. you had three hours, 20 minutes to finish a three-foot cake. How does how does your mind work in, in a scenario like this? Because during commercial break, I was chatting with you guys and saying, anytime I have to cook for someone, I am so stressed out. Totally. It's got to look great and taste great. But in this scenario, you guys have to do it on deadline, and there's a lot of money on the line. Yeah, and that time went really fast. We worked together every day, so it was easy to kind of delegate the tasks that who was going to do what. Um, and then we set like little timers for ourselves to make sure we didn't get off track. It's really incredible, and to brag, I mean, everybody needs to watch the show, first of all. Um, but you all took home $11,500, um, <laughs> which is really incredible when you think about what you just did in the competition. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was cool. You can bake a lot of baked goods with that prize money. <laughs> and I understand that you guys have had this uh, culinary school romance that happened about 10 years ago. You met each other in culinary school. You fell in love. Who knew that one day you would go on to create a bakery together? And this is, this is all family owned and operated. Correct, yes. It's so great. Well, let's chat with Ileana, who is with Sophista Cake out in Sugarland. You're in season three, episode six on the show. You're a home-based yes. baker uh, yes. with a Texas food handler certificate. You've been baking for about eight years. And right. okay, how did you apply? S someone asked you to apply based on your Instagram account? Yeah, uh, the producer sent me an email asking if I wanted to uh, try out for the show. So I was like, uh, I don't know, I didn't want to do it, but um, my daughter and my husband, they convinced me. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. So I went through the process and um, a few months later, they contacted me very last minute. And they said, you made it, you know, you fly out in a couple of weeks. I was like, okay, so <laughs> it happened really fast. It's like the whole so process exciting. was really really fast and you consider yourself i understand a cake artist not just a baker and all this began for you about eight years ago when you yeah. made some cake pops for your daughter's birthday is that right yeah i i don't like doing the baking part i prefer doing the decorating so and if you ask people they'll say well you're a baker you're a cake artist i'm like i'm more of a cake artist because i enjoy the decorating part it um, is so crazy. I, I mean, the amount of work that y'all put in, I mean, we're looking at all the pictures here and, and you scroll through the intricacies yeah. of putting this all together. And let's be, this is sugar, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, listen, we don't want to give away too much, but I know that um, <laughs> the episode was very intense for you, Ileana. And oh this God. is something that um, we just have to watch on Netflix, right? We'll watch it play out. But did yeah. you also consider not doing the show? You needed a little uh, convincing from your husband and daughter? I did. I did. I, I, it, I wasn't going to do it. I, I initially wasn't going to do it. And my daughter and my husband are like, you have to do it. I was like, okay, uh, then I, I had to pick a partner. Um, and that was kind of like the final decision. I was like, if my partner agrees to go with me, then I'll do it. Um, and sure enough, she agreed. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm going. And that's it was fun, awesome. I'll, I'll definitely do it again. I don't regret it. It, it was a blast. Well, it's so great that we're showcasing and that you shared all of your talents. I mean, we're looking at all of your work here on our set. And we've been tasting it as well. We have. <laughs> it is very, very good. We're out of time, but any any final words from uh, each of you? Uh, 
just for me, uh, feel free to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Sophisticate Texas. Yeah, and same here. We've got a storefront in Cyprus, so we've got a full case every day available for purchase. And then we also do custom orders. Ileana Rincon and Katie and Tom Johnston, thank you so much. And thank uh, you guys. Yeah, thanks okay. again for the, the goodies here, and congrats on the show. It's really exciting. Thank Enjoy you. the margaritas. Oh, I did. I already had one. <laughs> About to have another. We're also going to have a link on our website so y'all can connect with them as well. And I can tell you, these look great. They even taste better. They smell good, too. Yeah. It smells like sugar. All right, when we come back, a behind-the-scenes look at one of Houston's favorite coffee roasters, a peek inside Cat's Coffee, next. Whether you prefer hot or iced coffee, or coffee um, on the rocks, rocks. <laughs> Cat's Coffee has been serving some of Houston's toughest audience members of coffee since 2003. My favorite is the Velvet Espresso. That's the one we get all the time. Owner Avi Katz has been in the coffee business for almost 20 years with one goal, to achieve perfection in every cup. We all like to drink coffee. We like to smell coffee. But do you know where your coffee comes from? We're here today at Cat's Coffee to find exactly that out. Let's go. I am in the world's most incredible business. Uh, coffee roasting is so much fun. I started roasting coffee in 2003. Um, and really, uh, that's when Cat's Coffee began. We are entrenched in the community. We roast for local people. We work with the best chefs and operators in the city and the state. Um, it's really just been a blessing. Like, I had no idea I was going to be a coffee guy. <laughs> Perfect cup of coffee. Really, coffee is kind of a lot of science. Um, it's a whole lot of art, and there's a ton of passion involved with coffee. But when you come to the mechanics of extraction, it's really about coffee to water ratios. It's about water quality. It's about the correct temperatures, the correct grind size. And so there's like five fundamentals that really make the perfect cup of coffee. So now we're going to go check out how the production works here at Cat's Coffee. Let's go. Thank you. What are we looking at in this room? So this is basically all the segmentation going on for coffee orders. Uh, we're doing some weighing and filling of some retail bags of our Eureka line. It's coming off the scale and it's dropping prescribed weight, 12 ounces a whole bean. Then they get fed into this Bandrite sealer, deposited on this finishing table, and then we put the last little finishing touches on them by rolling the bags down and getting them ready for nice little packages for the shelf. We have some Bayou Blend. This specifically is designed for Buffalo Bayou Partnership. This is a unique blend. It's got two styles of the same bean roasted differently. So we have a medium roast and a dark roast of the same bean. We probably have 20 different countries of origin up here. These are the bags that come to us from the countries that we're buying from. And this wall is constantly rotating. Every seven to 10 days, we are receiving another 20 to 25 skids of coffee. So let's talk numbers here. How much coffee is cats making in a day? Sure, so depending on the days, we could produce up to four or 5,000 pounds of coffee, or we could roast one to 2,000 pounds of coffee. It really depends on how orders are coming in. In 2019, we roasted like 1.2 million pounds of, of coffee. That's a lot of coffee. <laughs> That's a lot of coffee. Yeah. All right, y'all. It's been so much fun today. It's been a latte fun here at Cat's Coffee. Hello. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Y'all, I love Katz's coffee. I used to go to the original location. Again, I said Velvet Espresso is my favorite. I can't remember which one Orlando really likes, but uh, little known fact, if you go to Katz's coffee, this is at 2400 Carbox Street. They serve free coffee to anybody who walks in their door so you can taste it before you buy it. It's fantastic. Oh, you're kidding. No, it's so good. And it's like walking in, it's like neighborhood. They all know each other and people that walk in, you can also order your coffee online. They'll have it curbside, ready to go. It's really Really fantastic. Very nice. I'm craving a cup right now. All right, so earlier we were chatting about disciplining other people's children. And, right. You know, it can be kind of awkward, lead to some weird scenarios. Well, uh, here's our comment from Dylan. Trying, um, try having to tell a mother she can't breastfeed her kitten anymore. Oh. And this is on an airplane, if you'll remember. Dylan, our friend who works for United. Yeah. Yeah. That's an awkward that's combo. That's a little awkward. Hopefully oh. that's um, not a scenario you'll see again anytime soon, Dylan. Ever. I know. We'll be right back. 
Coming up tomorrow on Houston Life, multi-platinum uh, country star Josh Turner from his signature low voice to the big names on his brand new album. Oh boy, that's a good get right there. <laughs> also, we have fruity wine slushies. Great way to start off a Friday. We're going to cool off with these boozy treats. How you can get your favorite glass of wine and turn it into a refreshing slushy with our friend Tangie Patton from Good Taste TV. Fruity wine slushy. Yeah. I think that was one of my nicknames in high school. I think so. Yeah. It's yeah. Fitting, right?